Hello, everybody. This is John Morcus. I'm here with Chris LaCava, and welcome to our online seminar. We're going to talk today about five things developers should know about UX. And actually, it might be more than five things by the time we're done. But thank you for joining us. This is a fun topic for us to talk about. Um, we are a group of user experience designers, user researchers, developers, and architects here at Xperio. And we work together on projects all the time. And what we've noticed in our, our consulting work is that many of the companies we work with have great developers um, who work well with UX designers, but the, those folks don't always have the best um, information available about best practices. And you know, I, I just want to say up front, I am not a developer. I'm a user researcher. So I'm one of those people who you don't want ever writing a line of code. Um, and I have great respect for developers. At the same time, you know, there's a lot that I can learn about development. What we're trying to do is share some ideas and best practices with developers about user experience. Some of my best friends are developers, and I really enjoy collaborating with them um, throughout the process of creating, designing, building user interfaces. And um, one thing that uh, we wanted to point out is that we'll have time for questions at the end. If you want to submit a question through the chat window, uh, please do that. And as we um, have time at the end, we'll get to those questions. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My background is in user research. Um, I've been with Xperia for a very long time, and I've been in the field for more than 20 years. And um, I've worked with a lot of UX designers and developers over the years. And so that's my background, and I'll let Chris introduce himself. My name is Chris LaCava. I'm a, uh, I'm a, a lead UX designer here at Xperio. Um, I also have some experience in product management as well as um, front-end development. So I bring a multidisciplinary background to uh, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. OK, and as I mentioned, we're a company of technologists and UX designers and user researchers. Um, we have been in the consulting business for a long time as a company, started in 2001. Uh, we serve a lot of companies. And here you can see a sample of some of the companies we've worked with. We've worked with many more, including some super secret ones that we're not allowed to tell you about. Um, but uh, we really enjoy working with different types of organizations, from small startups all the way to large enterprises. And often when we work um, with dev teams, and uh, what we've noticed is that there are great demands put on developers. So you can understand, you know, developers are asked to wear more hats than the Queen of England sometimes. Um, here's a list of some of the things that developers are asked to do sometimes for front-end work. Um, it involves a lot of uh, things like defining requirements and designing the UI, even the icons and doing some visual design work, um, getting feedback on those designs, actually implementing the front-end, which is primarily what we think a front-end developer's job is, and then sometimes helping out with the back-end, um, doing testing, um, and then keeping up with all sorts of things in UX design, and technology, and best practices, and processes, and all that. It's just a lot to ask uh, of developers. And so what we want to do is provide some tools and techniques that will help out a little bit in understanding the UX design. And also, if you're a manager of developers and you're asking your folks to do all this stuff, um, you might be asking them to do too much. So take a, a, a look and see if um, the folks even have time to do all this, let alone all the resources they need. OK, some topics that we'll cover. We're going to talk about why UX matters. We'll talk about how it's important to think like your users. We'll talk a little bit about process. Um, we'll talk about the importance of having a strategy and goals and then how to measure those things. And a little bit about agile processes and how UX work fits in. All right, UX matters, but what is UX? So there are a couple definitions that we'll look at. Uh, user experience it really is about perceptions that a user has when they're interacting with a product, uh, an application, a website, a service, or maybe even a company. 
Um, and those perceptions can be based on a whole lot of things. So it could be whether you had a good time while you were using it, whether you got your tasks done, uh, whether you had problems. Um, for example, look at that error message, you're not authorized to perform that operation. And then a little OK. So you don't really have a whole lot of options here. Um, but that can really affect your perception um, of your experience. Another way to think about it is uh, one definition that we sometimes use here at Xperia, and that is a user's feelings about the usefulness or utility um, of what you're providing to them, the usability, which would be how easily they can figure out how to use it and how quickly or efficiently they can do it, and then appeal or de desirability or joy of use, some kind of subjective measure um, or subjective feeling that a user has in relation to what you're providing to them. And then there are other things that come into play too, like security and performance, you know, how fast is the system, how reliable is the system, et cetera. And so if you think about what's a good example of a good user experience, for me personally, Netflix on an iPhone or, you know, some other device, but an iPhone for me is, uh, provides a good user experience in general, and Netflix also does. So it could be different for you. Um, and then it's important also for us to talk about what makes a bad user experience. So think about a bad user experience that you had um, and how would you describe it? You know, by definition, you probably say it's bad. You might say it doesn't work the way that I wanted it to. Uh, I was confused about what to do. Um, it was wasting my time. I, you know, I wouldn't use it again or I wouldn't recommend it to somebody else. And then why did I get an error? Uh, one of the things with error messages is it's really important to make sure that you point out what the error is and then also what the user can do to solve the problem. And a lot of times developers are in that role of writing error messages when really it should be a collaborative process to write those messages. You have to have somebody who is like a tech writer or a content specialist and probably a usability specialist and maybe even uh, a designer who can um, figure out what those messages should look like and um, how the user would interact with them. Um, so it should be collaborative and um, the error message here on the screen is a joke one that I found. Um, but um, it's kind of typical of how we often feel when we encounter error messages. All right, so bad user experience can lead to bad outcomes. And here's an example of a real life um, experience where you're trying to pump gas and the instructions, it would probably be better with no instructions. Um, it says here on the left to start pump, select green payment key, and there really is no green payment key anywhere. There's an area where it says payment key uh, near the top of the image, but there's no green anything. And then it says follow instructions on display screen, but then it says stop and do this other thing first. and whatever. So it, it's a, a bad experience and I personally have actually picked gas stations where the pumps are easier to use than, than other gas stations. I don't know if anybody else does that too. Um, and also if they give me a receipt or not, so that's a utility thing. But a lot of bad outcomes can occur with a bad user experience, including your perceptions of the company. Um, you might not want to use it again. You'll be dissatisfied. Um, you could uh, make errors. Um, it also leads to training and support costs for the organization. And a good user experience can help really help reduce those costs. Um, some applications that people use at work can be so bad that people will quit their jobs. And we've heard this through our user research. People actually quit a job or seek out a better job somewhere else that has better software for them. And you can imagine if that's your, your job and you're in there eight hours a day, then you're going to want something that is useful and usable, et cetera. Um, wasted time and money, um, either for the user or for the company that is providing it to you. And then there's this big need to redesign and rebuild, often uh, a bad user experience, or you decide you're just going to live with it, right, as a company. We're just going to go with it. Uh, but it can be really expensive. On the flip side, a good user experience can have all sorts of good outcomes, and they're basically the opposite of what we just talked about. Uh, so it could be all blue skies and beautiful vistas and everything. Um, 
but it is much easier to sell something to a satisfied user or customer or get them to adopt the next version of something if you've been satisfying them the whole way. So good user experience can have a lot of good effects, including less time required for redesigning and rebuilding the UI. Now here's some uh, results that we've gotten pro on projects that we've worked on at Xperio. So for one of them, we followed a user-centered design process and created a, a basically proof of concept for the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. That's the group that includes Child Protective Services. And that concept uh, helped secure $50 million in software development funding. And that wouldn't have happened, we heard, without them seeing a good user experience represented uh, in the demo. We worked with Charles Schwab on one of their websites and redesigned the navigation and added some contextual help and did some other stuff to improve um, the user experience. And they saw a decrease of, in support costs of 52% after that. Uh, we've worked with Ford on one of their main websites. And in that website, you would build your dream car, uh, pick all the, the model and color and options and everything that you want and then submit a lead to a dealer, and that counts as a conversion. And after our work, uh, we were able to help them double their lead conversion. And then for Lab 7, which is pictured here on the screen, uh, we created um, a user interface design that um, helped them enable rapid user adoption and also helped them secure some funding. So these, these are just a few uh, good things that can happen with uh, good user experience. All right, so it's important to think like your users. And uh, for me, as I was getting started in this field, it was a little, a bit of a trick to figure out, well, who are the users? You know, how is it different from how I think about things? But the main thing to keep in mind is that most of the time, unless you're writing software for developers, you are not the user. So you need to think uh, and figure out how the users would approach the situation. They're not going to be as technically expert a lot of times. They're not going to have the same background. Um, and so one, there are a lot of tools and things that we can bring to bear to help you figure out um, what the user, uh, who the user is and where they're coming from. So, uh, most users don't think like developers. So developers pretty much have an engineering focus where maybe they're concerned with the data mo model and logic and they go from there and that dictates what the user experience is. And what we're saying is for a successful user experience, you need to have a focus that matches the user's focus. And that is what should drive the data model and logic as much as possible. Uh, in knowing the user, lots of good things can happen. So this is a representation of some elements that go into a successful user experience. And you can see at the foundation, the bottom, is understanding the user audience, so the who part of it. And then also understanding the functionality, the what part of it, uh, is important. And then from there, you could be in a good position to design the user interface, specify what that user experience ought to be, um, and then go off and build it. So that's what the how part represents, is figuring out how to actually design uh, the UX and then what it, what it should be for building. Um, you can see on the left, we have usefulness and usability. So the who and what um, amount to usefulness, which we'll talk about soon, and the rest of it amounts to usability. If you have this kind of approach in mind, you will always understand who you're building for and what you should be building uh, as a base point, and that is critical to getting the user experience right. And a lot of times we don't have time as a team to get into this, or this is uh, something that people overlook completely, but it is critical. Uh, we talk about mind melding with your users, and um, if you don't do that, you're gonna end up having a bad user experience. So to mind meld, we recommend applying design thinking and having empathy for your users. So having empathy means understanding your users, understanding where they're coming from, what their concerns are, what their requirements are, uh, what they want and need. 
And um, design thinking is uh, a term that was created by David Kelly, one of my professors at Stanford. Um, and what he tries to do is get people to understand a good process for thinking about the user, um, prototyping some designs, and getting feedback from the target user audience. And not just having internal discussions for feedback, because everybody is smart where you work, and everybody has opinions, but rarely are they the actual representative target users. We want to get outside of the building, get some feedback from those folks, and then know whether you're on the, tr the right track or not. If you do that, then you will know before, well before you launch a release, you will have a good indicator of how your user experience will be received, whether it be positive or negative. So if you're off track, you can course correct in time. If you just make guesses all the time internally and then release it, then wait for user feedback, you're going to be disappointed a lot of the time. So design thinking is an approach that combines technology, business, and human values concerns. And where that intersection is, that's where you want to be. So guessing about users is bad. Um, the real answer is to do some user research. And the uh, uh, user research includes things like listening and talking to your users, um, creating personas. That's what these examples here are. Personas describe um, kind of a day in the life of a user type, um, the needs and pains and goals of that user type a little bit about how they might use the website or application that you're working on. And then we also have um, some personas um, that uh, we've created over time. Okay, and other techniques that you might uh, employ to understand users would include things like usefulness testing uh, and usability testing. And for usefulness testing, the real question is how valuable is a specific set of functionality or an overall application or device, et cetera. So it's about utility or value, and we have ways of assessing that with different techniques um, versus usability testing, which is assuming that those features and functionality will be in there. How easy and efficient will it be for the user to use it? So there's a distinction between usefulness and usability, and often usefulness is ignored and assumed guesses are made about what features and functionality should be um, presented without validating with end users. So we recommend validating that with the end users. And here's an example from a research report uh, where in the study we asked users, one person at a time, to try out in uh, a prototype some filtering features. and um, then we ask them, how useful to you are the advanced filters in this design from 0 to 10? And 0 means not at all useful, 10 means very useful. And so then they would respond, and then we can see what the, what's their average score, what's the range, etc. So in this case, those advanced filters were very useful. We also asked how easy to use were the advanced filters. And in this particular case, you could see out of the 10 participants, some people thought, it was not very easy. There was a score of one, and other people thought it was easy, so score of nine, um, and an average about five and a half. So um, it's really good to test both usefulness and usability if, uh, <coughs> if you want a good sense of people's perception of the user experience, because you can see people think that it's really useful once they figure it out, but in this case, it's hard for them to understand up front. Okay, now Chris is going to talk a little bit about the process. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to dive into some of the nuts and bolts around um, some of the topics that John's covered, and I really want to get into uh, a process that that we like to practice here at Xperio that ensures that uh, user experience is shepherded through um, the early stages or the 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 um, the strategic stages of, of the process all the way through implementation. I think that's the key, that um, that, that user experience, um, user-centered thinking is front and center at, um, through all the lockstep um, sets of, of, of uh, activities that go on. And in, in fact, in an agile format, 
when we're, we have a cadence where that's a cyclical process, it's even more important not to get caught up in some of the, um, the tactical aspects of just keeping the schedule. So um, I'll jump into um, what, what we believe is UX. And I think that this is, this is kind of a misnomer in a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions in that it gets delegated down to um, user interface design, interaction design, and sometimes even just the visual design. Um, when in fact the user experience <clears throat> lives inside a software application and outside of a, a software application, it's how a user uh, interacts with whatever product um, that, that you've built it, uh, for them to use as well as uh, interaction with a given company or other users outside of, uh, outside of the product. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a continuum here that we have to keep an eye on because at any point, um, a user could have a disconnect or a point of failure, and that may have nothing to do with uh, whatever software application um, a team is tasked with implementing. And um, in, in the bad old days uh, where this was a long process where we, you know, to build a, a, a software application, you may um, go through a cycle of 18 or 20 months where all of the design thinking, as John um, described, and the uh, requirements gathering and the use case mapping happened early on in that process. Um, the, the design aspects of it, the visual design aspects, were, were controlled by a few people, and a lot of assumptions were made early on. And then that went through a long uh, bout of engineering and, and quality assurance testing, and then finally the product was released. Um, we don't we don't so much live in that world anymore, although I think um, episodes of that still do occur, especially in certain industries. But we're more accustomed with uh, moving quickly and and uh, evaluating that um, aspects of, of UX through this continuum, all the way from uh, strategic goals down to uh, evaluating the acceptance criteria and, and um, any given um, tactical uh, implementation of a design. Um, in, in record speed, and it's only getting faster. And a, a good byproduct of this is uh, user experience thinking and user ex experience in general has been democratized, and I think uh, to a large extent is a shared responsibility across disciplines. And this is where development comes in, because I think uh, de uh, developers, uh, as well as product managers, as well as uh, user experience designers, user researchers, um, uh, marketers across the board all have a seat at the table when it comes to, to a holistic user experience. And the, the, the standards have been, um, have been set a lot higher now uh, that we're kind of in this mode of, of, of software development and design. Um, and you can see the fruits of this through you know, apps that we use every day, whether it be uh, a holistic experience on a smartphone or um, even, you know, even government agencies are putting out slick websites. Uh, that's all due to kind of this watershed moment um, where, where user experience has been democratized. So where does it go wrong and, and why does it matter to developers? I think, uh, and, and we'll explore this in a moment, but where it goes wrong is not necessarily that people aren't thinking about UX or aren't sensitive to it or don't know about it, it even in, in an engineering-centric uh, environment. It's that it's not inflected at the right time or consistently or in the right way. So that's what we're going to talk about, how things, how, how things kind of get off the rails in this process. Um, so what do you need for a successful software product? Well, first of all, it needs a purpose. So there has to be a problem or a gap that you're trying to solve with it. Um, usually there has to be a, a cogent um, articulated business opportunity or it wouldn't be sustainable. Uh, users have to want to use it or, or need to use it. Um, and it has to be something that's technically feasible uh, to be enabled through technology with good design. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other things involved there, a bit of luck and, and some, uh, some, some good marketing and sales, but um, without these four or five things, uh, a successful product is very, very hard to achieve. So I want to talk about where some of this stuff goes wrong within the process if you don't have any of these um, eight, four or five components. 
for example, if it's if if you don't have a good business case, then it's it's not sustainable. Um, usually, in the long term, it's not going to be able to fund itself and its growth. And uh, a, a software product that doesn't doesn't grow and improve, especially within within this agile world that we're living in, is, is usually dead on arrival. That users are now expecting things to rapidly update and improve and integrate over time. So. Um, when you're starting a new product and you're looking at discovering what all those things are, the technical feasibility, the, the business problem that you're trying to solve, the user's problem that you're trying to address and how, the, how, how best to do that, there's, a, there, there's, a, 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 um, there's, there's an interval of discovery where you're looking at that and you're trying to understand all those things, including doing a lot of user research to see how exactly to target the user. Um, when it's greenfield, and and you're especially when you're looking at new novel technologies or something that's a, a, a technological disruptor, a lot of times there's a fair amount of research and design that goes in, um, into that. And this is where you can get bogged down if you don't have a, a cogent process. So if you don't inject that user centricity um, outlook into this then a, a lot of times you're, you're, you end up being mired in a lot of, uh, of, of the research and design. So we tend to counteract that, what we, we call uh, discovery sprints. Um, and this is taking that design and product thinking and inject it back, back into um, a, a process that's going to move it rapidly um, into something, into someone's hands that we can validate. So this is what uh, design thinking looks like from a discovery standpoint. Um, you want to articulate early on those business opportunities. You want to determine the best way, both architecturally as well as user experience-wise, to, to um, enable that, that business problem um, and target the users in, in, in the correct way. Um, you then want to, as quickly as possible, prototype that, get hands on it, and hands mean usually end, targeted end users or the audience that you've identified, and that leads to validation. And you want to do, you want to constantly do this throughout a cycle, and that means carving off some time in whatever kind of um, development uh, uh, cadence that that you're using, it, it being an agile format or even. Um, in some cases, if this is waterfall, there are inflection points within a waterfall process that, that, that you can do this early and often. Um, so this is just a little bit more uh, detail into some of the deliverables that may come out of this process and some of the step-by-step um, -step, uh, uh, aspects of, of going through a, a discovery sprint. Um, you know, you want to you want to get in there and do the user research, identify identify the target audience. You want to make sure that you understand their uh, their goals and needs. You want to understand the problem space, the opportunity space, as well as um, some challenges of implementation. You want to um, a lot enough time to uh, ideate that solution um, with few constraints uh, around scope. Uh, to, to make sure that everyone understands that end-to-end -end experience, not just in the software, but uh, as outside of the software or the, or, or the product that you're trying to, to improve. And that's where some of those notions that John mentioned around empathy and design thinking really come into play. Once you've done that um, and you've built a, a, a cogent uh, backlog of requirements and you stack rank them, then you can get in and start to refine that solution, um, map it out, and um, really start to, this is where the interaction design and task flows really start to come into play. Um, and as quickly as possible, you want to move into something that you can test. And sometimes static designs are adequate. Um, sometimes in a big data situation or a complex data situation, um, static is not going to be uh, the, the, the best scenario. Or, or, or in a mobile situation where you have a lot of uh, tactile interactivity, um, sometimes you need something that works, and this is where um, certainly a developer um, can help in this process or someone with, with a, a development skill set in addition to a lot of these skill sets. Um, but I think um, de developers uh, in, uh, specifically have a very analytical mind. They have, um, 
they have a, a very uh, specific um, uh, point of view that they bring to the table through the whole ideation process that I think is invaluable. So I see developers, um, um, you know, uh, participating actively through through all of these steps. And I think in an organization that doesn't bring um, their development team or representatives of that team in early to define targets and, and do discovery work, that, that's a missed opportunity and probably going to be a crack in a, stra in a, in a UX strategy that develops into a problem later on. So, um, you know, the first thing you need to do is, is really, really define the problem and isolation of a possible solution. And that makes sure that you really understand the parameters of that problem. Um, and it really needs to be concise but general and, and really shouldn't include the solution um, to, to, to really get at the heart of the issue and have everyone rowing in the same direction, laser focused on that problem, because that brings purpose. It's the job that the, the, the product is going to do, and that has to be clear in everyone's minds, and stakeholders have to be aligned as well as everyone that reports up to them. Um, and the clearer and more cogent that, that problem, the, the more people are going to be um, aligned correctly to solve it. Um, so then you start to get into the solution space and you turn that frown upside down and you kind of go through a process of, of making sure that you, your, your solution um, has a vision, it's got a target audience, it's strategic, um, and it has a measurable goal, and that, that's probably the most important because when things get murky, when times get dark and you're, you're, um, you're, the release is slipping, you can always go back to that, that, that measurable goal and say, are we tracking to this? Or if something um, goes out into the marketplace and you, you want to you bring it back to where you started, you always have that, that signpost that keeps you honest. Um, so uh, on the right here is an example of how one of these solution statements might look for, for a specific uh, use case around um, coordinating chronic diseases in healthcare. Um, as John mentioned before, knowing your users, knowing their pain points, knowing their needs, knowing their familiarity with a, the with a given technology that you, you want to base your product on, um, knowing what their environment is like outside of software. So for this example we have on the right here, we're looking at healthcare provi providers such as doctors and nurses. They live, they live and breathe a frenetic environment. Um, you can think of what a nurse's station looks like in an ER, for example. Um, you can make a lot of design uh, and requirements uh, mistakes here just by not taking that into account and thinking, well, they're going to be laser focused for hours on your application. And the, the, the case is, is they're not. So you need a different kind of interaction model. You need something to be much more performant in a lot of cases from a, from a development standpoint to be able to fit into that environment where their alarms going off and code blues and people uh, walking up to them in an interrupt driven environment. Um, so. Um, that's really where knowing the user and doing the user research um, really pays dividends and becomes very expensive mistakes if they're not taken into account early on in this discovery process. Um, so then only after we do a, a lot of that legwork do we start to get into designing things. And this is a, you know, this happens to be a visual design here, but um, there is a continuum of, of design um, uh, activities that take place from napkin drawings all the way through to, to workable prototypes. And um, it's beyond the scope of this discussion, but there is, you know, there, there are a lot of methodologies that we em employ here depending on um, what kind of, of design task we're um, embarking on. Um, but, but suffice it to say, the, the, the common link through all of this is taking into account that, that um, that user-centered user uh, aspect of it. And the, the way to do that is to pull that common thread through, through all of these processes from discovery all the way through validate and all the way through um, inception to launch of a, of a product. So uh, user goals, real important here. Um, design to those user goals that you outlined in your, 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 um, your persona and your requirements because these are the things, and these should be quantifiable to some degree, Time to task. user has to finish this task in 30 seconds or less. Well, that design looks a lot different. That 
that front end architecture looks a lot different, that back end architecture may look a lot different taken into those accounts. And those measurements are going to come up in the validation process. And that's what's really going to um, allow you to, to uh, use those as the guideposts to, to, to keep you honest with, um, with, with uh, your user experience goals that you set out and really even state it at a high level in your, in your, in your solution statement. So now we're ready to prototype. We've got the design. We know who we're targeting. We know why we're targeting them. We know what solution um, we, we want. We know what problem we're going after. How much do we prototype and, and um, how much time do we spend on this when we, uh, when we get to the point where we want to build this out to validate um, with hopefully end users or potential end users? And the, the short answer is it depends. Um, Sometimes when you're just testing uh, mental modeling through navigation, um, you can do that with a paper-based prototype. Uh, when you're testing, you know, terabytes of information that a user has to absorb um, in a matter of seconds, that's a different type of user interface. And that probably most likely means that um, if they're traversing that data, that that's going to have to be somewhat interactive. Um, and there's something to note from a development standpoint that the, usually the single biggest impact you can make on the user experience, at least within software, especially web-based software, is performance. If something is not performant, then it's not usually not useful. Even if it's the most beautiful design, even if it's the, you know, the, the, the best choice of, of technologies to deliver it minus performance, um, it's, it's just not going to be useful. So, um, so you have to take a lot of that stuff into account. And this is why the, the user experience is something that the team shares and, and pulling developers in and having those conversations, even if they're hard conversations that, hey, look, if you make this design decision, it may be the best um, design with, without considering performance. But when you put performance into the equation, everything falls apart. The sooner that you can figure that out, the, the better. And, the, the, the longer it takes to figure out, usually the more costly it is to reverse out of, uh, out of a product. So we want to get that prototype in front of people, and we want them to click around, and we want to see where those user goals, those metrics, those quantifiable metrics that we put in place, time to task, um, uh, success rate of completion of tasks, all of those things uh, measure up to to the standards that John uh, outlined uh, earlier on. And um, we've got to be honest with ourselves on these metrics, and we've got to give ourselves enough room to course correct. Um, because if you refactor this stuff later, um, after you've built on top of these things, um, it's going to be very costly. But if you're incremental and honest with the results, and you pull in that, that validation, and you course correct both from a design perspective and an engineering perspective, incrementally your product is going to get better faster. I can guarantee it. It's, it look, looks like it's bogging down, but if you're incremental about it, um, it's actually a savings and efficiency. I'm going to bounce it back to John here. He's going to talk about um, a few strategic goals and metrics that, um, that, that um, I touched upon um, in my process talk. Yeah, so to build off of what Chris was talking about, um, you should really have high-level business goals that you're working toward as a team, and those are going to feed directly into some specific goals for UX often. If it's not just a back-end project, perhaps to improve performance, but there's, there's a front-end component, um, then you can see an example here of what we're talking about. Um, we worked with Borland not too long ago on a project and they had this high level goal of encouraging user adoption and that would help with sales as well. Uh, they said they wanted to delight their end users, which was something that we sometimes hear from enterprise software companies and that's awesome when we do because we, we love those projects. Um, figuring out what it takes to delight a user is uh, a big task. It could be different things for different uh, situations, but we like that sentiment coming from the client. Uh, they wanted it to feel like an iPhone and not enterprise software. They wanted innovation. They said, as a team, we can come up with a really innovative solution, and if it's too much to implement or it takes too long, then we'll pull back. Um, they wanted it to be better than existing tools out there. 
and uh, we thought all of these were really good goals. Uh, and they said, by the way, everybody on the team, the UX folks, are um, going to uh, vote on whether a story is done or not. And if the UX team says it's not done, uh, just like other disciplines have the, the option sometimes of saying something's not done, uh, UX team in this, this case, because of the important goals that have been set, will get to say um, whether something needs to be uh, continued or not. Here's an example of uh, a mock-up that was tested early on with users to uh, assess different ideas for features and functionality and a little bit about the layout and interactions on the screen. And then here's a later design of the same screen. You can see this one uh, looks more like a real screen and um, it's been validated in terms of the functionality's utility and also whether it's easy to use, whether it's efficient to use, whether the design looks good, et cetera. So that went through that whole process that Chris was talking about. And then um, throughout the project, we had specific UX acceptance criteria that helped guide the team. And so in this case, um, this is um, an example of contextual help where the user wants to understand more about user stories and how to write them. So they would um, access this help content. And for this specific case, we had some user uh, experience acceptance criteria shown here. So some of it dealt with behaviors. So what should happen uh, when users do certain things and then styling, you know, what should it look like? And then contents, um, where is the information coming from? So it's coming from different places, as you can see, and then some specific guidelines and styles for all of that. And so once the dev team was able to um, meet these criteria, then the, the stories related to this would be considered done. Now, that's not to say that UX folks should always hold up a release for stuff that's minor. Uh, you don't want to do that. You want to understand everything that goes into it, be realistic, and especially if there is uh, you know, a sign that the, in the next release or next sprint something will be addressed, um, then that can be a really good situation. Okay, and so UX acceptance criteria can be new to some teams that we've worked with. They, they kind of get it once they understand that there are important UX goals that need to be met. Um, but before that, you know, a lot of teams don't see specific UX acceptance criteria. So hopefully this is something that you can incorporate in your team when it's relevant. All right, and then Chris is going to talk a little bit about uh, agile processes. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, why these things are important and maybe what they are. But, the, you know, the big question is, is how do they, how do they fit back into this ever-increasing um, churn of, of, of a lean cadence uh, type agile process. And the uh, short answer is it's very tricky. It's hard to, um, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a hungry machine that's churning through work and measured on how much throughput and how high the quality is in a lot, in a lot of cases. And to be able to um, inject back in uh, strategic thinking that's just in time. Because let's face it, if you plan and design too much too far out, then um, it, it, it dies on the vine. It becomes stale and um, it doesn't fit back into the agile process. So there is a just-in-time component to this, but not so much that you're doing it within the churn of the, of the tactical uh, implementation process of a, of a, for example, a sprint or, or a combine process. So just a, a, a quick, um, intro to what Agile is. Most people are, are exposed to it now, but those who are, uh, who are not, it's really just a, uh, a methodology um, grounded in roots in manufacturing, but has since been um, augmented and, and changed to fit um, development um, opportunities and software usually. Um, but it, it underscores collaborative, cross-functional, um, you, you're always looking at continuous improvement, bite-sized pieces of work, um, and being able to agilely or flexibly respond to changing requirements or, or, or changing market um, 
winds or what have you. So um, th it's beyond the scope of this talk, but there are two main processes that everything else is kind of evolved out of, and people m mix and match a lot of these things um, and have come up with offshoots on a lot of these, but generally there's a scrum-based method which is, um, you know, sprint-oriented. It's very much about optimizing a consistent cadence and predictability about when things are going to be um, uh, released out of a out of a development cycle, and then there's Kanban, which is more about optimizing a consistent flow, a continuous flow, if you will. Um, yeah, both have their merits, both have their um, their their challenges. Um, for the for the purposes of this talk, the common thread through both of them is that we're really talking about um, lean incremental improvement, and there is a there's a bifurcation from a UX perspective that you really have to take into account where you, you want to tactically support this um, from a design and requirements perspective without sacrificing some of the big, uh, larger view strategic um, uh, efforts that have to happen, even within these processes currently, um, you know, always churning through, through work from a, from, a, from a manufacturing perspective. Um, so this is just an example of what this may look in a sprint look like in a sprint situation. Um, so this is kind of a uh, you know an abstract of we'll, we'll call it Scrum, but these are you know intervals. We'll say two week intervals where you've got the current, next sprint, sprint after that into perpetuity. Um, there is still discovery work that has to happen. That should not be happening for the current sprint, obviously. But there are also um, product requirements. Uh, UX design as well as development. That includes UX development as well as, as other systems. Um, and they have to work in concert uh, to support the current sprint, but also to be able to groom and, and um, prioritize and solidify what's going to be next. And look at that in a bigger picture that discovery um, affords through this umbrella of uh, what we're calling story mapping here, or not what we're calling, but a, a methodology called story mapping. Um, and that includes potentially rapid, rapidly prototyping, uh, A-B testing, and doing um, lean user research and target audience outreach to validate. Um, so just a quick um, intro on story mapping, again, out of the scope of this talk, but um, I think it's a valuable enough tool that we should talk through uh, just, a, just a few aspects of it. Um, really what story mapping does is it takes a backlog of requirements and features and it breaks it up through functional areas as well as um, user, we'll call them user goals, but they're, they're things that, that users want to uh, traverse through, that, through, through the, that set of functional areas to, to complete a, a task or a goal. And it gives some dimensionality to the backlog. Backlogs become these kind of like, you know, uh, graveyards of, of all kinds of crazy ideas that are hard to prioritize a lot of times and sift out the important things and the things worth investing in versus the things that people are, you know, are just kind of accumulating over time because uh, it was discussed whether it's pertinent or not. Um, and it kind of takes things out of the realm of, of thinking purely from an engineering standpoint and, and couching that in some market-based, product-based, and in user-based um, uh, criteria and, and, and content. So this is what a, a story map might look like. Um, this is kind of a, a, a generic, very basic view of it. But if you see here along the top, the backbone are those large functional areas. Um, then you have incremental things. Sometimes these manifest themselves as epics. Sometimes they're things that are, um, you know, become your information architecture. And so if you look at from managing orders, to processing orders, and then below that prioritized from high to low is all of the story-based, um, or in this case they call them tasks, but they're really story-based things that will enable that process. So uh, then you take a user journey and you map it across this. What things, to, to, in, in order to have a user complete a task, a given task, we'll say like order, order something um, from a shopping cart, what do, I, what do I need to do throughout this process in each of these functional areas to uh, enable that horizontal task? And that gives you your priority. 
And that's, that means when you release something, you can say, now our users are able to do this. Let's measure that. Let's see how effective that particular uh, user journey is. Um, it brings a lot of relief um, and, and detail to, a, to an otherwise flat list of backlogged items. So um, just a few things to throw out here where, where pitfalls arise in uh, UX pitfalls, specifically in, in, in agile format methodologies. Uh, a lot of times it's just that schedules slip, things get jammed up, and like I said before, everyone has UX on their mind, but they're in implementation mode. They're in that current sprint and, sprint and they got to get that stuff out the door. And that's where product managers, designers, and developers alike run out of good options and they've got to make the least worst options. So that's, uh, you get into this vicious cycle of cutting corners a lot of way, a lot of, a lot of times when you sacrifice that strategic outlook and you don't get ahead of the sprint. Um, so uh, that's, you know, all of these pitfalls can kind of be boiled up to, 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 that, to, to that point. Lack of visibility over, over the backlogged items, lack of prioritization of those items, and just caught in kind of this, um, this, this tactical execution-based um, myopic view of things. And that can be solved with process. And again, just democratizing a lot of the things that John and I have talked about around UX. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to John. He's going to he's going to sum up, and um, if we have some time, open up to questions. Yes. So um, focusing on user experience can help you do a lot of great things, which we've talked about here. Um, one of the important things, just to touch on again, is the um, reduce the reduction in rework by UX and development resources. So a lot of the projects that we work on are done because there is an issue uh, with the user experience and sometimes people don't know what it is. They think it might be visual design initially or something else that could be deep in that stack that I showed earlier. Um, and getting at those fundamental issues can fix things but can also be very expensive. So uh, understanding that up front can save you a lot of time and money. Uh, another thing that's interesting here is uh, following this process can help you understand what features and functionality you don't have to support anymore. So what if you do usefulness testing, you can understand, you know, what can we remove from this application or website and be done with? Uh, and that's a really good thing to know. Okay, reminder, developers often are asked to do a lot of things and it's really hard uh, to keep up with all of this. So it's good to have those tools and techniques at your fingertips. Now, one of the things that we can do to help uh, is provide training. So uh, Spiro has a lot of training courses available. One of them is a course called UX for Developers, and it, it touches on a lot of the topics here as well as many others. But our courses are taught by folks who work in the trenches all the time on actual projects. We also do training. Um, we have a lot of experience in the field and um, a lot of experience with software projects. We customize the courses to meet the needs of the organization that we do the training for, so we can help pick the topics, um, help pick exercises that the team in training would focus on. Um, we can figure out whether it needs to be on site or done remotely to meet the needs of our client for training. And we've been doing this a long time. So um, we've taught at least 10,000 people. We stopped counting after a while. Um, and we've done a lot of our training at conferences sponsored by the Nielsen Norman Group and other places, Graph Day, Day to Day, um, et cetera, lots of different conferences around the world. For our UX for Developers training course, we have a lot of topics that could be included. We can customize these based on needs. We've talked about some of these a little bit already, um, but there are many other topics available, and we have courses that range from a day to, or two days all the way up to a four-week boot camp, which includes some curriculum and also some hands-on um, work on actual projects that the customer cares about, so real projects where we're there to advise um, as the, the team gets into the details of it. All right. We don't have a lot of time left, but um, if anybody's interested in any of our training courses, uh, you can reach us 
through our website or by emailing us at info at experioinc.com. And now we want to see if anybody has any questions for us. All right. Um, so there's a question here about whether we have any certification courses in UX. And the answer is we don't at the moment, but we're planning to in the future. So um, once we do, we'll let folks know on our website, or if you want to shoot me an email, I'll make sure to let you know when that happens. We do have a variety of courses for UX practitioners, and they're described on our website. Another question here, um, this one's from Bill. Are there any resources or example cases that show how projects can fail without uh, upfront UX architecture. Um, yes, I mean, there are, <laughs> that's pretty common. So um, the, the problem of jumping in and building before the um, information architecture or the UX design is at least somewhat done and thought about, um, that happens all the time. And that is often a, pro a problem because UX activities have not been factored into the process. There hasn't been time or they don't have resources set aside to work on that or to work with the team. So that's a real danger. And a lot of the bad user experiences out there, you can probably um, surmise that that's exactly what happened. Is it's either a question of knowledge of the people working on it, UX knowledge, or factor you know, of time just not being available. I'll give another quick anecdote about um, how uh, more technical UX and development input early on um, can can help and when it's not there can hinder a UX project. Um, when you're working with large data sets and complex data sets, I think I mentioned this before, but a very common problem is, is that um, when a lot of attention is spent on design, but that design stays static for too long and not exposed to developers, um, sometimes you just plain design the beautiful wrong thing where um, where people uh, that people will design something that can't scale or even worse they build something for large data sets when the data isn't actually available at least in the format that they expect so uh, there's a technical aspect to user experience as well as um, some of the stuff that John mentioned where um, sometimes user experience just isn't injected into the in, into the um, process uh, at all. Okay, well we are out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you do have questions or comments, please reach out to us. The easiest way might be info at experioinc.com. Um, Chris and I also are on Twitter, so you could tweet at us as well. And we want to thank you for joining us today.